Great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rajesh Kashiranjan, who is the Associate Professor at a National Institute of Advanced Studies at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Um, Dr. Rajesh's research uh, interests are in cognitive science and philosophy of mind. His current work relates to applying combinations of philosophical argument, mathematical techniques, and empirical observations to classical problems in cognitive science and the philosophy of mind, such as the semantics of natural languages, the epistemology of beliefs, and the structure of intentionality and consciousness. So please welcome uh, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's a wonderful experience to be here and to be listening to the various talks. <clears throat> and as uh, David has already mentioned, these topics are so huge that we could spend the next 500 years just sitting here, but we don't have that much time. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is to bring out some of the connections that come between mind, consciousness, and the world that living organisms occupy, but from a very different perspective, from either the, um, pers so from both perspectives presented this morning. So the first thing I want to say is, you know, there are two kinds of scientists. Um, and I, I, I remember reading this in David Rule's book. So there, people become scientists for two reasons. One is, they built labs in their basement and they did, they tried to blow up their houses using test tubes, right? And then another kind of person becomes a scientist because they read a lot of science fiction and um, wanted to go where no one has gone before or something like that. So I come into the latter category of scientists. I don't think I ever tried blowing anything up as far as I know. Um, and. So I want to begin with a little ec a quote from a very good, long story. It's, it's, it's sort of a short novel by Arthur C. Clarke. It's called The City and the Stars. And in The City and the Stars, you know, this is set in another yuga, to use uh, uh, Indian terms, hundreds of maybe millions of years later, right? And um, the protagonist says, is trying to find out what has happened, like why, why is the earth the way it is? And what he's told eventually is that human beings had evolved to such a point that they had managed to travel into space and they went very, very far away. And somewhere at the outer limits of the cosmos, they met an intelligence so superior to what they were that they decided to come back and work on themselves for a hundred million years. Before they, dis before they felt that they would be ready to face this superior intelligence. So, which is a great theme because this conference is about cosmology and consciousness. So it's not surprising that as we reach the outer limits of the cosmos, it also makes us want to examine our own selves and find out, do we really have the capacity as we are right now to understand what this cosmos is. So when I say in my title, the new anthropocentrism, I mean that at some point, we have to examine who we are in order to even really understand the cosmos for what it is. Uh, and it's not that easy, which I'll mention in a minute. It's actually very, very hard to understand who we are. The Modern scientific perspective is that we are very, very not special. It was mentioned many times, right? So there are about 43 orders of magnitude, and we are right in the middle somewhere. We are about as much smaller than the universe as we are larger than quarks, approximately. So we are very, very unspecial. We may not be, you know, the, we, we are simply not that great as far as the universe is concerned, or that's the standard story. But that's a very objective perspective. I just say in a world of objects where quarks are objects and bacteria are objects and we are objects and galaxies are objects, we are a very unspecial object. But even in the sciences, it's very clear that we are very special subjects because we are the only species, which was mentioned earlier today too, that wants to understand all these objects. 
On Earth, at least, we are the only species that wants to build spaceships, which cares about UFOs. Um, so, strangely enough, if you explore the world of objects very, very carefully, you seem to come back to the world of subjects. And in the world of subjects, we become more special than we should be. And so there's this strange tension between saying that we are extremely unspecial subjects to making us very, very, I mean, unspecial objects to making us very, very special subjects. And that dialectic is the one that I want to explore. And this is a problem that runs throughout the history of modern philosophy and mathematics, so the theoretical sciences in many ways. So in the morning and in many of these meetings, you, will be, you would have heard about the experimental sciences. So the sciences which involve going out and collecting data and having faith in the data. But sciences also have a very strong philosophical and theoretical history too. Right? And mathematics in particular is a handmaiden of the sciences in the theoretical side, not, in the, not so much in the experimental side. And I come from a math background. So I'm going to start with this discussion of the, specialty of the specialness of subjects from going back to a the first early modern philosopher, Rene Descartes, who was both a mathematician and a philosopher. I know Rene Descartes was a um, Frenchman, but in those days, if you had interesting ideas, France was not necessarily the best place to live. So he fled to Holland, and Holland was cold, like here, right? And so he spent his days hidden inside a wooden stove. It wasn't, it wasn't burning, but that was the only warm place in, in the building that he was in. So he would hide himself inside the wooden stove and think these thoughts. And I have a feeling that some of his philosophy took the shape that it did because he was kind of hiding inside this wooden stove. But his point was very, very interesting. He said that he wanted to be a scientist and he wanted to base science on the most certain knowledge that you get, because why? If you want objective knowledge, you want it to be certain. And he said, in order for all of science to be certain, we have to start from the most certain thing that is possible, right? And he said, what is the most certain thing that is possible? So he starts, is it certain that there is a car outside on the road? Maybe there is and maybe there isn't, right? You hear something honking, do you know it's a car? Well, maybe it is a car or maybe it is some kid who's playing with a toy car that makes the same sound. And he carries this argument further and further. He said that I can never be certain of anything outside because, and this was a very Christian way of putting it, he said that maybe a devil is really manipulating what's being seen by me so that instead of me seeing that there is a, I'm actually seeing that there's a car outside, but it's really a devil who's doing that. Anyone who has seen that movie Matrix will understand this particular analogy, right? So this is, Descartes is the original theorist of the Matrix. So Descartes says, I can therefore not be certain of anything objective outside. So he starts by trying to found signs of objective reality in the most certain way possible, and he actually finds out that nothing objective can be certain. Instead, the one thing that you can be absolutely certain of is your own consciousness, right? So he says, I think, therefore I am, which is to say that it's my experience of my own consciousness that I'm certain of. My consciousness could be mistaken about what it is about. So I might be experiencing a car, but it could actually be a bird, or it could be a plane, or Superman, or whatever, right? But what you are always certain of is that you are experiencing something. Whether you're in a dream, whether you're awake, the fact that you're experiencing is the one certainty that you have, and nobody can take that away from you. Somebody can come and tell you that you are actually experiencing a bird when you think you're experiencing a plane but nobody can tell you that your experience is not that of a bird. 
because your experience is your own. It's the one most certain thing that you have. And that's the beginning of the modern investigation into knowledge, right? Because knowledge and epistemology, another term that was used today many times, is the foundation of science. If you cannot be sure of the methods by which you do your experiments, then it doesn't matter how many experiments you do. If you're, exp I mean, and the harder the problem, the more certain you have to be about the conclusions of your experiments. And something like, is there life on other planets? Or is there consciousness in bacteria? Is the kind of problem where you need methods that are as certain as possible. And therefore, the study of epistemology is central to addressing these questions. And the study of epistemology comes back to human knowledge and how we acquire it. And the one field where we think we are pretty certain, outside, of course, our subjective consciousness, is mathematics, right? Two plus two is four, independent of whether it's me or you or anybody else doing that. So a lot of investigation in the modern philosophical disciplines has taken mathematics as the paradigm of a science that delivers certain results. Now, mathematics has a problem. You could argue, what is 4? So is 2 plus 2 4? Because there is something that makes 2 and 2 into 4? Or is 2 plus 2 4? Because that's just the definition of 4, right? Is 4 nothing but? two added two times, and in which case you're just redefining four into two and two. So these are questions that are of great philosophical interest, but they became of great scientific interest toward the end of the last, actually the 19th century, when philosophers and mathematicians started making these into formal disciplines, and they invented what we would now call mathematical logic, and the foundations of computer science. So people like Alan Turing, Kurt Gödel, they started thinking of how a machine could do something like mathematics. And you might think, why would anybody want a machine to do something like mathematics? But the reason is, if you think that human beings are also machines, if you think, as many scientists do, that we are nothing but the movement of molecules in certain biochemically constrained ways in our brains and in our bodies, then there must be a mechanical way to explain how we are epistemological beings. See, here's the big problem. If I say two plus two is five, and you'll all shout, I'm wrong, that's not because you um, moved one molecule against another. Molecules, when they hit another molecule, don't produce right and wrong, right? Molecules just hit each other. Physical entities which undergo causal reactions don't become right or wrong. There's nothing right or wrong about an atom moving around another atom. There's nothing right or wrong about um, a planet moving around a star. But there is definitely something right or wrong about reasoning and about ethics, about the things that we human beings care about. So how do you get things like right or wrong from machines? And that's what makes mathematics such an interesting subject, because it's in mathematics that people first figure out how maybe you could reduce questions of right or wrong into questions that machines could potentially solve, right? And the effects of that are all around us. I mean, all these machines that we see, my, my talk, actually I'm not using any slides, but if you're using a slide projector, you're using a machine that is based on information technology that at some point is founded on ideas of Turing and Gödel and others who figured out how to make information manipulation into machines, right? So that's a very, very important development of the 20th century. It's the mechanization of reasoning, of logic, which 
also has its limits. So one of the things that we have discovered in the 20th century is that just as science in terms of asking questions like, is life really different from physics? Or is how can consciousness arise from matter? There's a similar kind of limit that comes from a logician or a mathematician's perspective, which is, are there thoughts that can never be thought? Are there problems that are intrinsically unsolvable? Are there things that are Im impossible for us to think? Now, these are questions that um, at some level seem maybe too abstract, but they actually have led to some great developments. Right? It turns out that there are most problems in some quantifiable mathematical sense. If they can be posed, they probably cannot be solved. Right. So there's a very famous theorem by a mathematician named Gödel, which says that any mathematical system that is more powerful than arithmetic has theorems that are true, but that cannot be proven. Now, this is amazing. It means that it's true in some sense, but no amount of calculations or manipulations can prove that it's true. And that's pretty amazing. And so this is a new development in the understanding of knowledge and its limits that comes from mathematics. But then it moves in a direction that is more consistent with biology in the development of the mind sciences. So the mind sciences are very, very new. They are even newer than biology. Right? And their biggest impulse comes in the 1950s when people start trying to use computers to model the way the mind works. And what they find is that computation is a good way to try to understand how the mind works. So let me give you an example. Um, I'll use English. You can translate that into Tibetan. In English, I can say, I ran past the door. I can then say, I was wearing a brown dress when I ran past the door. I was running, I was wearing a brown dress on a rainy Tuesday when I ran past the door. So you can see how each sentence is embedded in a, inside another sentence. And this has a very mathematical structure. And yet, anyone who speaks English knows that these sentences are all grammatical. You intuitively, without thinking, know that these sentences are grammatical. So somehow your minds work and my mind works in such a way that we produce these perfectly grammatical sentences which have a very intricate, complex structure and nobody ever taught you. In fact, I'm almost certain that there's not a single person in this room who before, say, five minutes ago had heard the sentence, I was wearing a brown dress on a rainy Tuesday when I ran past the door. Right? So the first time in your life you heard a sentence, and you figured out that it was grammatical without anybody ever teaching you. How is that? And so cognitive scientists, and in particular a very famous cognitive scientist called Noam Chomsky, made a hypothesis that the reason why you can figure out that all these sentences are grammatical is because your mind is made that way, that you have an innate capacity which is mathematically describable to think of language, I mean, that you have a capacity for language that is, in modern language, hardwired. There is something genetically hardwired in you to think in certain ways. And that those certain ways can be modeled using mathematical techniques, in particular mathematical techniques that come from computer science. So that was a very, very important development. The next important development comes again using mathematics, how do we see the way we see? Right? Remember, we are investigating knowledge and how human beings and other creatures acquire knowledge. And one of the ways that we acquire knowledge, and in Buddhism in particular, perception is seen as the foundation of knowledge. Right? Buddhists are very skeptical of concepts being uh, the source of knowledge, but perception is at the source of knowledge in all Buddhist traditions. How do we perceive? You open your eyes and you see 
three-dimensional object. So when I open my eyes here, I see lots of people wearing uh, robes that are sort of maroon, uh, right? Some maroon and some dark red. How do you do that? How do you see 3D shapes? And why is this a puzzle? Well, let me give you three puzzles here. One is that the input to your visual system consists of two 2D images on your retina. But when you open your eyes, you don't see two 2D images. You see one 3D percept. So how does your mind convert 2D images into 3D percepts? Now, you might think, especially if you know some mathematics, that this is easy. All you're doing is taking two projections of one 3D object, and you're doing a reverse geometry. Right? So, you, so anyone who has done technical drawing will know that you can have different projections of one object, and I can reconstruct the 3D object from the projections. But it's not that easy when we are doing it as people. Why? Because when you are seeing the world, you're moving your heads and your eyes all the time. Right? You saccade about five times a second, which is to say that your eyes focus on a different location five times a second, right? But the world doesn't seem to be moving to you five times a second. For most of you, you have a very stable percept of the world. So you perceive a stable world, even though your eyes are moving five times a second, your bodies are moving all the time, you are kneeling, you're getting up, you're raising your head, you're doing all these things, and yet it's not as if the world is moving. You know that the world is stable. How do you? extract this stability, this stable sense of a 3D world, even though you don't actually get that as an input. And here's a very simple experiment you can do. Stare straight, and then move your eyes, not your face, but your eyes to the right as much as possible. OK? Did it seem like the whole world changed? Probably not. And yet, there's not a single pixel on your retina that's getting the same input that it was getting before. There's a 100% different input, and yet the output, the percept that you feel, is almost the same. So this constancy, the fact that the world is constant in your perception, and therefore in knowledge, which is what allows us to say that we have some kind of reliable knowledge of the world, is done despite the absolute dynamic instability of the input to your senses. And this is a very, very difficult problem to understand. And it's been almost impossible to solve using computers. So we now have computers that play chess better than any person, right? Maybe Gary Kasparov is the only person in the whole world who can defeat Deep Blue. Tomorrow, I'm sure there will be a better computer than him. And yet, there's not a single computer in the world that walks around a room and grabs an object when asked. So for example, if I tell a computer, go around the room and collect all the water that has been left by people in this room, you can't do it. If you tell any person they can do it, but a computer cannot, why? Because there will be water that's been left in mugs, there will be water that will be left in cans, there will be water that will be left in bottles. And there's no computer which recognizes that all of these are just receptacles of water. Here's another thing that we do very, very easily and which we cannot get a computer to do. So I lift this bottle over here. Immediately, I know that that bottle is not on the table anymore. I don't need to think. I automatically know that stuff, when you move, is moved. Computers don't work that way. In fact, that's one of the great things about our computers. You can do copy and paste. So you can have two copies of the same object. But in our real world, its ontology doesn't allow you to do copy and paste. Maybe some future quantum computing will help us do that. But right now, we don't. Right? So the kind of furniture of the universe that we as human beings are completely used to, and we think that that's just the way the world works, is something that is extremely hard for us to understand how it does. And this is a hard problem that's different from the hard problems of physics and the hard problems of biology. 
because it's trying to understand why is it that our world is experienced by us in the way that it is. It's not an objective world and it's not a subjective world. It's somewhere in the middle. It's a little bit like money, right? Money is both objective and subjective. I can't just, I mean, unless I'm the Federal Reserve or something, I cannot just print money, right? It's really there. You make a salary every month and that's, what, that's how much money you get. It's not in your head, it's out there in the world. And yet without human beings, there's no such thing as money. Money is a human construct that requires creatures like human beings to be there for it to exist. So the study of things that exist in an interdependent sense, to use a Buddhist term, not things that exist outside human beings or outside living things, but things that exist because there are living things and because there are human beings is a whole new world of study that is just opening up. And that's the study that cognitive scientists do. That's the study that we would like to do for other creatures. Now, there, there's a famous philosopher, Thomas Nagel, who wrote a paper called, What's It Like to Be a Bat? Right, and he said, you know, human beings are visual creatures. We learn about the world primarily through vision. But bats are not visual creatures. Bats live in caves where there's almost no light. They, are, they use um, sound to navigate the world. And what Nagel basically conjectured is that there's simply no way for us as human beings to understand what is it like to be a creature that figures out the shape of an object, but using sound rather than vision. I mean, for us, the shape of an object is what you see. But what does it mean to see using sound? We have no idea. And what Nagel therefore says is, it is impossible for us to get into the mind of a bat. This goes back to Descartes, right? Descartes basically says, I can only be certain of my own consciousness. Even someone else's consciousness, I have no idea about. So Nagel basically takes that idea and transplants that into other species. Instead of, so maybe we know what other human beings are doing, but we may never know what a creature that's as different from us as a bat will ever do. And I, don't, I cannot even think about things like octopi, which have, or, or the other cephalopods that have eight brains. I mean, it might, they might just be too different from us for us to ever really know. But as scientists, Again, in the Star Trek mold of scientists, I think this is a great opportunity to move into certain spaces that we have never gone into before. So these are not spaces as in different stars. These are not spaces as in different planets, but into the life worlds of other species. Right? What is it like to be a bat? May be very hard for us to understand, but maybe it's now possible for us to understand what's it like to be, say, a rhesus macaque. Now, macaques are monkeys that are not very, very different from us. They're also social creatures. They're also visual creatures. So maybe the way to make scientific progress on these kinds of questions is to go from how human beings think to how other primates think and how, from how primates think to how other mammals think and then perhaps all the way to bacteria. Right? And once we get there, my very wild conjecture is that if we really want to figure out how life is going to be on other planets, we'll first have to figure out what's it like to be another creature on our planet. Why I say that is, actually bacteria are very, very different from us. I mean, but we're also interrelated. So, Creatures that are simultaneously alien and yet similar, but are on this planet, are a lot easier to study than potentially existent creatures on other planets. So one thing I think astrobiologists should do, therefore, is to study creatures that are rather different from us, and maybe we need to invent something like a mind scope, right? Just as telescopes, and radio astronomy and things like that help us get into other planets 
in terms of their physical characteristics, we need to start building devices that will get us into the worlds of other species. And I don't think it's impossible. So let me give you an example of something that, you, I mean, here's a thought experiment that we can try to run. Just imagine that you put a camera on a bird, okay, and let it fly around and accept that hook the input, I mean, the output of that camera into your system. So instead of me seeing what it's like for me to see, I don't know what it'll be if I spent three days just seeing what this bird is seeing, right? I mean, I don't know if our nervous system is plastic enough to shift its register from seeing my world, which is a human world, to seeing the world of another species. We haven't done it, but the technology is here. And so it should not be that hard for us to start building these kinds of mind scopes. And I think that once we start doing that and once we start collecting the data, it might turn out that there are some things about other species that is very, very hard for us and some things about other species that is very easy for us. Just as, as it turns out, building machines for doing chess is easy, or at least easy enough, but doing machines, building machines that collect objects is very, very hard. It's actually not clear to me what is it that, let's say, bats do that's very hard, and what is it that bats do that's easy. So these are things that can only come when different kinds of scientists, and not just scientists, but scientists interact with other traditions, especially traditions that have explored experience in a very, very detailed way. So one of the things that excites me about the relationship between the contemplative traditions, Buddhism is the one where it has happened the most, and science, is because these traditions have a very, very rich taxonomy and theorization of experience. Science actually, so cognitive science and psychology have a very strong desire to understand experience, but we don't have a very good theoretical grasp on the different mental states and the different perceptual states and the different emotional states that say Buddhism has. Right? So you read the Abhidhamata Sangha and you see the rich vocabulary there. Science doesn't have that. But my point is that that vocabulary is exactly what we need to really get beyond the sort of naive anthropocentrism that we have in the cognitive sciences. Right? When I say naive anthropocentrism, I mean that accepting our experience as a given. No, no self-respecting contemplative would, would accept ordinary experience as just given. It's one of the tasks of any contemplative tradition to probe experience and to find out what are the things is it organized in levels? Are there higher or lower kinds of experience? Are there subtle or gross kinds of experiences? These are things that scientists currently don't think about so much. But once we start bringing those kinds of theoretical and experimental distinctions, we can start understanding how human experience works. We can start understanding how non-human experience works. And maybe it won't be too far down the road I don't know, maybe 100 years, when it won't be impossible to, for us to be experiencing what it's like to be a bat or a, uh, maybe even an octopus. I don't know. I mean, but that's my sort of Star Trek moment, which is that instead of going into outer space, if we can go into the life worlds of other species and then use that to probe what it'd be like to be hypothetical creatures, since we don't right now have evidence in other planets, then we have a real science that's happening. Okay, so with that, okay. thank you.